Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Uh, we're going to talk about the Great uh, Commission today. And so, so glad you're all here. A couple of announcements before we uh, jump into the Word of God. Uh, as many of you know, we have uh, our connection groups meeting today. I know some are meeting at lunch, some are meeting this evening. We've got seven different connection groups. We meet in, in homes and sometimes up here, sometimes at restaurants. But on, on the back wall in the foyer, there are lists of those people that are on uh, in those groups, connection groups. If you'd like to join a group, just go back, pencil your name in on one of those groups and contact the leader and say, hey, where, do you meet, where are you meeting today? Now, today, LaVon and I are going to go to lunch with somebody and with, to dinner with somebody. So life is good. I love these Sundays. Join the connection team if you get a chance. I do have a couple of announcements first from one of the students it's uh it's got a little picture with it ls students it says i love god and i love church and then there's amen in parentheses from um madison i think that's who that is that's from madison there you go but there's another one from from this family right down here uh courtney and alex are officially williams part of the williams family tomorrow tomorrow that's adoption day for them. Adoption day. In other words, we love them, and they are loved incredibly, and they are part of this family, and it makes me go to tears because it's beautiful to belong to a family, and that's incredible. And so uh, thank you, families, for what you're doing in the lives of these awesome kids, awesome kids. Um, can we pray about that just a second? Can we do that? Let's bow together, okay? Holy Father, you bring people into relationships, and we don't know how you do it, but you do it for our good. Especially today, and tomorrow is adoption day for these two, uh, for Alex and for Courtney. We thank you for bringing them into this family, and, and pray, Father, that uh, you continue to bless their lives through this family, but also through this church family. Thank you for bringing us together as a family of followers of Jesus Christ, and thank you for blessing us because of that connection through Jesus Christ we pray and the whole church says amen, amen. okay we're going to study a little bit Matthew 28 19 and 20 uh, we are uh, getting to the uh, to the end of let's see got to turn this on that would be nice uh, to the end of our uh, discussion about listening to God and, and we know that Jesus Christ when he was on the earth he he spoke the words of God to everyone and so we are always going to be listening in what Christ says and today we're going to talk about a scripture in many of our Bibles it's uh, it red letters and so that's words of Christ specifically so this is Matthew 28 uh, 16 through 20 I'll read that right quickly and then we'll get to talk about it a little bit uh, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain on which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, and some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always." to the end of the age. If you'll remember last week, the, the apostles were gathered around Jesus and, and, and they were not sure what was going to happen next. And Jesus said, I am going to the Father. And, and they, in just a minute, they saw him go up in that cloud in that Shekinah glory cloud of God, just God coming down and picking Christ up and saying, you're coming back to heaven with me. But before he left, he said uh, these things. I, I, he said to those following him, I'm going to prepare you a place. And I can't help but think the apostles got excited about this. Wait a minute. You're going, Jesus, what? You're going to make a place for me in heaven with God? I'm in. Sign me up. I'm pumped. I'm excited. At the very end of the, the book of Luke, it says they returned with worship in their hearts and enjoy because of what had just happened when Christ left. But that's not what all he said. He said, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. Then he says, wait a minute, I will be interceding for you from now on. In other words, I'm going to represent you 
to God. Whatever you're going through, whatever tough times there are, and there are some every single day, every single week, I'm going to intercede for you. I'm going to go to God on your behalf, and I'm going to tell him what's going on with you, and so he'll bless you in a special way. Jesus is saying, I'm going to intercede. And the apostles were saying, that's fantastic. That's great. Thank you, Jesus. And he said, wait, I'm not through yet. I'm not through yet. And then he said, I will send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will move into your life. And the Holy Spirit will help guide you and comfort you and teach you and, and give you strength throughout all of life. And, and help you understand what the Christian life is all about. And the apostles once again are saying, that's enough. Don't do any more. Because they knew how incredible all those things were. And then Jesus says, I'm going to do all those things for you. There's something I want you to do for me. Which brings us back to the passage. He says these things that we know as the Great Commission. Somebody said, we are enjoying the commission of God because we get to do it and we get benefit from it. Here's the song I wanted to lead for us today just to kind of fit the message of the story of Christ and the Great Commission. So sing this along with me if you will, okay? Come we that love the Lord and let your joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. And thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching up to Zion. On the beautiful city of God. Let those re used to sing who never knew our God. Oh, but children of the heavenly king, but children of the heavenly king, they speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will be interceding for you. I will send the Holy Spirit for you. And then he said, now go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We want to talk about this word disciples. The scripture says go and make disciples. So those people who were following Jesus were often called the apostles, the twelve were, but then there were a whole other group called disciples. We got to figure out what that is because if Jesus said go make disciples, that's what I want to be, a disciple of Christ, right? You may not know this, but the, uh, the word Christian, which I'm proud to wear the name Christian, the word Christian only appears in Scripture three times. Only three times. The word disciple shows up in Scripture 255 times, which simply in my book means this is an important word. I looked up the definition of Christian just while I was sitting in Randy's class. You know, he's got a great class going on, but I really go to his class so I can figure out what I need to preach about. It's a pretty good gig to learn those kind of things. But I looked up the word Christian, and here's what the word Christian means to our society today. Those who believe in the teachings of Christ. That's it. Look it up. Wikipedia, you know, the source for all sources. Those who believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. That is a totally different meaning than what this word disciple is. Now, Jesus said, keep in mind, go and make disciples. He did not say go and make Christians. All right? These words mean something, guys. Go and make disciples. So here are some things that disciples are. They, were, they are followers of Christ. They learn from Christ. And they emulate Christ. 
These are the things that God and Christ intend for those apostles to find in the lives of people who are believers in Jesus Christ. They move from the word Christian like we interpret it to a word called disciples. It's so much more than just being a nominal, by name, Christian. It's a term which means I am all in. In fact, look at your scriptures. Look at your scriptures in this passage again. All right. All authority in heaven, that means God gives Jesus the right to say these things and and, and commission the folks. Uh, Has been given to me. Go, therefore. That means as you're going. That's a life of going. Make disciples. That's what we're talking about. Of all nations baptizing them in stop right there we talk a lot about baptism it's an important scene it's the thing it's imperative really and in every situation in the book of acts when people believed in jesus christ they were baptized immersed in water for their forgiveness of sins acts 238 and so many other places 10 different episodes in in acts where they were all baptized into christ because of their belief in jesus christ but this word in i have circled in my bible this word in is the word, the Greek word ice, E-I-S, or you might say it, I like what you get out of your refrigerator, okay? It's ice, which means in two. It doesn't mean baptize in the name of, okay, in the name of, okay, in the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jerry is going to be a bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah. You don't know how far off I am right now. In the name of Dr. Whoever, I'm going to take this medication. That's not what it means. It's the E-I-S word, which means into the name of. Okay? That E-I-S word means into the name of. In other words, when I am baptized into Christ, that's the way Galatians says it, 327, Baptize into a relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's that baptismal situation. That's why it's so important. That's why we talk about it a lot. But we don't talk a lot about what's next. What's next after you're baptized into Christ, which is an incredible thing. We've had a number of baptisms this year. It's that life of a disciple that is to emerge from the waters of baptism. That discipleship, which means I'm a learner of Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm doing what he's saying for sure. And all these things he says, teach them all of my commandments. And and in addition to that, I am emulating Jesus Christ. Do you want to know Jesus' plan for us to take the world for the cause of Christ? Discipleship. It's all wrapped up in this one word, disciple. Jesus says, go and make disciples, because when a person is a disciple, that means he's a learner and a follower and an emulator of Jesus Christ. I'm going to do things just like Christ. I'm going to love people like Christ. I'm going to forgive people like Christ. I'm going to give mercy to people like Christ did. I'm going to give grace to people like Christ did. I'm going to be serious about Scripture like Christ was. I am going to be, as far as I can be, a disciple of Jesus Christ, an emulator of him. <clears throat> Some time ago, I uh, <clears throat> realized that there's a lot of passages that say, um, because the Holy Spirit is in me, which Christ gave me, which makes me righteous, not the stuff that I do makes me righteous, but the thing that he does in me makes me righteous. My goal is not to get to heaven. Wait, I said that wrong. It is not my goal to get to heaven, all right? God's already promised us that. Our goal then is different here. Our goal is to emulate Jesus Christ. Our goal is to be like him. No matter what happens, I am going to do the next Christly thing. Whenever I'm with somebody at school and they're telling some jokes that are not that great, I'm going to do the next Christly thing. I don't know what that is exactly for you. It may be walking away from that group. It may be correcting that group if you know them well enough. 
It may be that you turn the situation to say, what would Christ say in this situation? I don't know in every situation exactly what you're going to do, but if you're in Scripture, like Christ wants us to be, in fact, one passage says, this is how you know that my disciple, you're my disciple, if you abide in my word, if you live there, if you live for the word of God. I was at a church one time, and I was a, I was a missionary kind of guy, and I came back to preach to that church, and it was kind of interesting because... Uh, it didn't really matter what I said because they weren't supporting me in the mission field, so I could say whatever I wanted. Kind of nice every now and then. And a, a church of about 300 folks, and I said, how many of you guys are daily Bible readers? And about three hands went up. And I said, apparently you're not disciples of Jesus Christ. Now that's a little bit of a slap in the face. That was the last time I spoke at that congregation. Because one of these scriptures that says, well, John 8, 31, unless you abide in my word, you can't be my disciples. And so there's our source for knowing what Christ would do in every situation. It's the word of God that tells you about the life of Jesus Christ. Abide in the word, get in the word, live the word, love the word of God. And that kind of goes along with our theme of the year, doesn't it? Listen to his voice as you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciple. Luke 14, 26 says something pretty interesting. Hate your family or you can't be my disciple. Some of you guys do that pretty well, don't you? Now, just a little bit before that, Jesus said to love everybody, even love your enemies. So it can't be a comparison of, of the love that, that you have versus your enemies and how you're supposed to treat them. But it is to look like you hate your family in comparison to how much you love Jesus Christ. See what I'm saying? Love your family, absolutely. Love your enemies, absolutely. But when it comes to the things of this world that you love, Christ has got to be at the top of the list. Is it that way with your, love your money. This is tax season. Wow, I can't teach about that, can I? Don't worry about those things, Christ says. God will provide. But love him first. Love Jesus Christ. It may look like you hate your family. That means you're going to make a decision whether your family goes to church or not. You love God more than you love your family. I remember when LaVon and I were first married, uh, I kind of caught this idea, and I've told you this before. I said, if, you know, if God came and took me, I would rather go to be with him than to stay here with you. Not a good way to say that. Not a good young married husband was I. It wasn't too long after that she felt exactly what I said. She said, I've got it figured out. I'd rather go to be with him than be with you too. <laughs> it was a pretty good plan. But we function that way ever since we were married. Loving God first is what brought us together. And so when you see the perspective that Christ is telling people, hate your family, make it look that way, love them dearly, but love Jesus Christ and what he's done for you more. Here's what Luke 14, says. Give everything up or you can't be my, say the word with me, disciple. A learner, a follower, an emulator of Christ. Wait a minute. What did Christ give up for you? Every single thing. He gave up home. By the way, he didn't really have a home, did he? He gave up his family. He said one time, uh, wait, who are my brothers and my sisters and my mother? They are those who are followers of God over my biological family. Hate everything. Give up everything. Boy, those are radical statements, are they? Give everything up or you can't be my disciple. Now what that means is God blesses you, but when you give things up, he blesses you more on the other side. Don't you know that? You figured that out yet? The things that you will sacrifice, maybe Sunday morning hours about all you got, but you sacrifice it and so you're here. When you give up for the cause of Christ, 
he blesses you incredibly because that's proving that you are a disciple. And here's one more, John 15, 8. If you bear much fruit, you prove to me my disciples. When I was a young minister, I thought, I'm going to bear so much fruit. I mean, we're going to have fruit pies everywhere you go. Fruit of the Spirit is what I'm talking about. Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Here's some fruit that this scripture is talking about in your life, and this is how we're going to change the world, okay? The fruit of the Spirit is love. We're not going to speed through these. Hold on a second. Love. Do I love God more than I love my pizza? (laughs) Thank you. I love pizza. My favorite kind has pineapple on it. I'm kind of weird. But we use that term love. And and we use it for a whole bunch of different stuff. I love pizza. I love, well, I used to say the Dallas Cowboys. I can't say that anymore. But do you love your enemies? The fruit of the Spirit is love. If your life demonstrates love for all people, but God above them, then you will be bearing fruit of love. Joy. Is your life one that is full of joy because what Christ has done? Remember that passage at the end of Luke when Christ ascended and and the apostles went back just full of joy because of those three things. He's preparing a place in heaven for me. He's he's, uh, one who's interpreting everything I need, just interceding for me, and he's bringing the Holy Spirit for me. That's reason to be joyful every single day. What is your countenance like? When you walk into a room, does a bright sunlight come in with you? Woo, yeah, it's a good day. Life is good. Christ is my Savior. I'm going to heaven. He's blessing me and everything. And everybody else around me knows, woo, it's a good day. I want to be in that light. Or do you walk into a room and there's this cloud like we've been under the last three days? It's a cloud of doubt. It's a cloud of negativity. It's a cloud of nothing's going right for me. It's a cloud. Oh, my goodness. Nobody wants to be in that cloud with you. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy in the Lord. I'm excited. I'm thrilled with every single day. Even though I woke up with parts of my body not feeling good. Parts I didn't even know I had two days ago. And yet I still am joyful. Because what Christ has done in my life. Love, joy, peace. Peace, brother. Everywhere you go, you're bringing peace into the situation. You're caring for people enough to hear their story and bring some kind of compassion from God. Peace. Or it's wherever you go, does it become very violent and angry and I'm going to bring some conflict to the situation. Or do you bring peace? Patience. I know we're, we've all heard this before. I, I want to get some patience. I, heard, I wish God would hurry up and give me some of that. Patient with your spouses. Patient with the preacher search. Patient with our government. Patient with our bosses. When we display patience, that's the fruit of Christ in our lives. Kindness. Kindness. Are you kind? Are you a kind person? You know, I love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. Does somebody look in your life and say, that person's a faithful person. He's faithful to God. He's faithful to his church. He's faithful to his spouse. He's faithful to his children. He's faithful to his job. He's faithful... Wow, that word goes a long way, doesn't it? Are you a faithful person? Brotherly kindness. Guess what the whole story ends with? Self-control. And, and self-control is a big one. Are you a self-controlled person? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Or do I fly off at the handle when things don't go my way? If you're going to be 
a disciple of Jesus Christ, you will bear fruit. You will bear these fruits everywhere you go. And when you bear those fruits, or the fruit, as the scripture says, it's the fruit, it's singular, by the way. That means all of these things go together in one big lump. It's all on one tree, and the tree is Jesus Christ. We get all those fruits on one tree, and they bring them into our lives, and we bear them all. And when we bear them all, we become, we are, we prove ourselves to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Is there a difference between being a Christian and being a disciple? Consider Rwanda. Do you know that story? I'm going to finish with this. Almost 30 years ago, 30 years ago next month in April, there was a nation in Africa, and it's the nation of Rwanda. There was a minister and his wife that were here that ended up going there to be missionaries for a while. They had what is called a genocide situation. There were, over the course of 100 days, there were a million people, 800,000 to a million people that were murdered. Did you know this? A third of those people were murdered on church property. Now, here's the interesting part of this whole scenario. We, we heard about it. We saw it on telev television. There was even a movie called Hotel Rwanda. Maybe you've seen that. It's pretty violent. It's pretty gruesome. Horrible things happen to humanity there. A million people slaughtered each other with machetes. It was horrible. Here's the scary part. 97% of them called themselves Christians. How can that be? It's because they called themselves Christians, but they were not disciples. And what does Jesus say about your enemies? Bless your enemies. And when somebody slaps you on one side of your cheek, turn to the other. Those were the teachings of Christ. And yet there's a huge difference between calling ourselves Christians and being disciples of Jesus Christ. Huge difference. Today in Rwanda, Christianity on the most part, has collapsed because people see that those Christians, their words did not match their actions. The Muslim faith is taking over the country because people were not disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to be more, church, not just Christian in your name or attending a church service like this, which is a beautiful thing, because God has blessed us with a great thing called the church, the ecclesia, the call out. I'm asking you to take another step to becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. John 15, 8 says this, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Bear fruit this week. Bear the fruit of Jesus Christ. Bear the fruit of the Spirit and show yourself to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing a song together, church. Have you a heart that's, that's weary, tending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard he loves you and that he will abide near the end? Where is your heart, O oh pilgrim? What does your light reveal? Who hears your call for comfort? When not but sorrow you feel. Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my friend? Have you heard he loves you and that he will abide till the end? Who knows 
nurtured disappointment. Who is each time you cry? Who understands your heartaches? Who dries the tears from your eyes? Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know? at all but I mean Jerry's words this morning inspired me and I know they did you uh, our time together is special uh, really is as a family uh, it's really special uh, God says they'll know you're Christians by how you treat each other it all draws us closer to God uh, we uh, we love Jerry Savage and we love LaVon and our time together is growing short. And you need to back off a little bit. <laughs> Mornings like this really cause us to miss you. <laughs> no, seriously, it's, it's a special time together when we come together. And, and I know that you, you know that. Uh, our connect groups tonight are special times. And if you're able to be a part of that, you're blessed by that time together as you grow those relationships with those five, six, seven couples that you meet with. If you've not been a part of that, uh, I encourage you to take a look in the bulletin. Any, any one of the groups would love to have you, uh, welcome you to come, and it would be a, it'd be a, a special time for you. And that's, that's, what, it, that's what it's all about. Uh, we mentioned last week our a contribution to the church in Canadian, Canadian Church of Christ, and many of you responded individually. I know some of you gave money to me or others. Some of you wrote a check and mailed it to Canadian. Uh, there's the address up there. Uh, we're going to send a check this week for $5,000 to that church, uh, and some of you that have given us money, it'll be in addition to that, but I wanted you to know that. Uh, that that recovery will take some time uh, and many of the members of that church uh, lost uh, resources, uh, homes, uh, livestock, uh, income and, and that will uh, the elders will certainly distribute that in an, in a, an appropriate way. Uh, we also needed to, to make mention that uh, Kathy Thompson that's been uh, secretary, at this church for some time is is going to retire. Uh, she's she'll be around. I don't think Kathy and Terry are here this morning, but she will be around for a while to help us with the transition. Uh, we are looking at that job description expanding somewhat to to uh, possibly become a full time position. So, uh, and hopefully that's a position that we can feel within the congregation. So wanted you to, to know about those things. Okay. Uh, let's gather hands if across the aisle if you move together. We, we've got some folks uh, that are part of this congregation uh, that are, are dealing with difficult times. Uh, I see Terry Pinson back there. I give Terry a special hug. Uh, he's, he's got some things going on that are real serious in his health. George Tinberg uh, had a pretty serious procedure done recently in a very timely manner. Uh, Kay Bomar is uh, really, really ill, and uh, her days with us are, are numbered. Uh, Jim Ramey uh, lost a sister last night in a tragic way, and, and we... Uh, we grieve with them, and that's what family does, right? And uh, Jerry led a song, so can I lead a song too? <laughs> I don't have the words up, up here, but maybe, maybe enough of you know it uh, that can sing along with me. I certainly don't want it to be a solo. 
But anyway, you may notice we say brother, sister around here. It's because we're a family, a family that's near. When one has a heartache, we all shed a tear. That's because we're a family, a family that's near. I'm so glad I'm a member of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joy without measure, eternal my home. I'm so glad I'm a member of the family of God. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear God, we pause at this time to uh, come before you. Uh, we honor each other with our relationships. We treat each other in a, in a godly way. But God, we honor you in a so special way uh, by the lives that we live and the way that we treat each other and how we study and, and, and grow in our knowledge of your word. God, help us to have a thirst for your righteousness, a thirst for your word that drives us each day. We, we understand that, that this charge given to the disciples is just as imperative today as it was when, when it was given to the eleven. Uh, God, help us look for opportunities. Help us to live a life that draws people to you by the Christ they see living in us. Thank you so much for his son, for our, our Savior, for the sacrifice that he made, uh, for the things that he taught, the things that he said, the way he treated people. Uh, God, what an example for us to, to be followers of. And may we strive each day to do a better job of that. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.